Welcome to Anatomy and Physiology Lab. This is Lab 2. In this lab, we're going to be discussing the organ systems, and then we will also be discussing the organization of the human body. There are 11 organ systems in the human body, but in this lab, we'll be discussing four of them. First of which is the skeletal system, then the integumentary system. Next is the nervous system and the muscular system. And throughout the semester, we'll be going into more detail of each of these four organ systems. The skeletal system is critical for providing support for the body. The skeletal system is also going to protect organs. And it's also critical in hematopoiesis, which is the production of red blood cells. The integumentary system is going to be most obviously our skin. Um, integumentary is Latin for covering. The integumentary system is going to act as a physical barrier to keep out um, foreign objects um, such as bacteria or viruses. Um, and it's also going to keep moisture in because water is so important. We want to maximize our retention of water. The integumentary system is going to be involved in hair and nail and glands. Um, these are going to have various functions that we'll get into later in the semester. And it's also critical in synthesizing vitamin D, uh, which is an important vitamin for bone development. The nervous system is composed of the CNS, or the central nervous system, and these are the uh, major components of the nervous system, which are the brain and the spinal cord. But then also we have the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS, and this is all the nerves throughout the body. Um, and how these two systems interact um, is shown in this flowchart here. So let's pretend we touch a hot object, um, nerves in our hand are going to pick up that information and it's going to send action potentials or electrical signals uh, to the brain through these nerves. But still, to this point, we don't necessarily know that we're touching a hot object. All we have is uh, electrical signals being sent via nerves to the brain. When that information gets to the brain, the brain says, okay, I'm touching something really hot. Um, and I need to react to it. And so it's going to send electrical signals back to the muscles in the arm or the hand that are then going to result in removing the hand from a hot object. And so clearly the nervous system has huge um, impacts in um, how we respond to our environment. The muscular system is composed of muscles and muscles are composed of individual muscle fibers that are going to work together um, to accomplish some sort of movement. Muscles work only in one direction, and when they contract, they shorten, and they pull on other parts of the body. And muscles typically cross joints, and when muscles pull on another body part, the movement of the joint actually allows that other part of the body to move as the muscle pulls it. And muscles are either going to decrease or increase joint angles. So we have a schematic of a muscle here. We see the arrow is would be the muscle contracting and pulling in that direction. And what happens is a decrease in that joint angle when the muscle contracts. Muscles are also going to be involved in uh, body openings, such as our eyes and our mouth. And we'll go into more detail later in the semester with what type of muscles those are. When we're referring to a, a patient or body parts, it can be confusing because, you know, typically if we're, if we're thinking about a right arm or a left arm, we can say, well, is it my left or is it your left? But to standardize that, anatomists have a standard anatomical position. And this is defined um, in figure three on page six. And it's basically standard anatomical position is shown on this the right side here, this figure on the right side. And it's defined as body is upright 
it's facing forward. Arms are straight at the patient's side. Palms are forward. Legs are straight. Feet are flat. Eyes are open. And standard anatomical position is always from the patient's perspective. And so there's now no more confusion about, oh, is it my left or is it your right? Well, it's always from the patient's perspective, so it's always their right, regardless of what you're looking at. We're going to have some very important directional terms, not only for this lab, but also for your career. And those are summarized in Table 1 on page 7. Superior is defined as above something. Inferior is defined as below. Medial is towards the midline or towards the middle of the body. Lateral is away from the midline or away from the middle of the body. Superficial would be towards the surface. So, for example, freckles um, on someone's skin are considered to be superficial to the epidermis or your skin. Deep would be towards the core. So, for example, if freckles are superficial, then veins that are in my arm are deep. Anterior or ventral means towards the front. We're going to use anterior more often. Ventral refers to um, animals. Um, so since this is a human anatomy lab, we're going to use anterior. Posterior means towards the back. Um, again, dorsal is typically used for animals, so we're going to stick with posterior. Proximal, this is used for extremities, and this means near the trunk. And distal is also for extremities, and that means away from the trunk. So for an example of distal and proximal, our fingers are distal to our shoulder. And... Likewise, our shoulder is proximal to our fingers, and that's because the shoulder is closer to the trunk than our fingers are. Let's go through some examples of this, and these are maybe um, possible questions or examples that you might see on a practical quiz. Is the head superior or inferior to the shoulders? The head is above the shoulders, so if you answered superior, you are correct. The shoulders are medial or lateral to the neck. Well, the correct answer here, again, is lateral because the shoulders are away from the midline as compared to the neck. The skin is superficial or deep to the lungs. The correct response is superficial because the lungs are actually deep and the skin is superficial. The rib cage is anterior or posterior to the spine. The correct answer here is anterior because the spine is actually posterior and the rib cage is anterior. And then are the fingers proximal or distal to the elbow? And the correct response here is distal, because those are further away from the trunk than the elbow is. Another way to organize the body is by anatomical planes. And this is ways that we can section the body. A sagittal or a mid-sagittal plane is shown here. And you can imagine this as cutting the body in two even halves. We can also have parasagittal, which would be cutting the body in uneven halves, as shown in the orange lines on that figure. A coronal plane is if we cut the body in anterior and posterior portions, as shown in that image. And then transverse is if we cut the body in superior or inferior portions. And anatomical planes are going to become really important, especially in um, our upcoming lab, Lab 6, Histology. Because when we look at tissue types, the way that tissues are cut 
either in a coronal section or a sagittal section, are going to change the way that that tissue appears on the slide. And so these two images are images of skeletal muscle, the same skeletal muscle. However, they're just cut or prepared in different sections, and they clearly look completely different. So understanding which plane each of these is prepared is going to be critical on a practical quiz, but also later in your career because medical software is going to present data taken from a patient differently. These are CAT scans of um, a human brain, and we have, it's the same brain, but they're just prepared in different anatomical planes. The one on the left, what plane is this image prepared in? This is a transverse plane. The image in the middle, what plane is this image prepared by? This is a mid-sagittal image. And then finally the image on the right, what anatomical plane does this show? And this would be a coronal plane. So we can see that these anatomical planes are going to be very important. They're going to show us different um, different images of the same of the same basic structures, but they're just going to present them differently. And we can also organize the body based on cavities. Um, we have two major cavities, the dorsal and the ventral cavity. The dorsal is made up of two separate cavities, the cranial cavity, which would be superior, and the vertebral cavity, which would be inferior. Cranial cavity is going to be the brain. Vertebral cavity is going to be the spinal cord. On our ventral cavity, we're going to have um, two, two individual um, two individual cavities, the thoracic cavity, but also this abdominal pelvic cavity. The thoracic cavity is going to contain our heart and our lungs, um, and the abdominal pelvic cavity is going to contain the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. And these cavities are um, going to be important because they just summarize the body. There are ways for us to organize the body. So what should you take away from um, these AV lectures? Since this is your first AV lecture, um, it's important to think about the, the bigger issue, uh, what's going to be important for a practical quiz. Um, and so I'm going to try to lay it out for you, um, especially early on in the semester, so we get on the same page. So take-home messages for Lab 2. We want to know what organs or structures are associated with the four organ systems that we're going to focus on in this lab. We want to know what is standard anatomical position and how do we use it and why is it important. We want to know those directional terms from table one on page seven and we want to know the three anatomical planes and why they are important and when we might use them not only in this lab, but in our careers. And we also want to know what are the two major body cavities, the dorsal and ventral, and we want to know the smaller sub body cavities found within these two other major cavities.